Hello, my name is Dr. Janelle Ott and I teach double reads at Angelo State University and bassoon at um, Abilene Christian University and McMurray University in Abilene. Before moving to San Angelo, I taught private lessons with middle school and high school students in the Dallas area for several years. So I thought it would be nice to do a video on the all region etudes for 2022 to 2023. This is a resource for my students, but also for anybody else who is working on the All Region Etudes and wants to hear a run through or maybe could use a little advice. So here we go. I'm assuming if you've gotten this far, you've already seen the videos for Etudes 1 and 2. So briefly, um, make sure that you get your eyeballs on a copy of the edition recommended by TMEA. You can find that on the readlab.com student page. Um, also, you are going to have to learn how to read tenor clef. I have a video for that. You are also going to have to play with vibrato. I have a video for that too. It will be in the notes in the description for this video, as well the videos for etudes one and two. Um, okay, etude three. Uh, in some ways, this seems like a less intimidating etude than Etude 1 because it's in a friendly key signature. We've got two flats. We love two flats. We're used to playing in two flats. It makes us happy inside. Um, but there are some things that are tricky on this one. Uh, I think this Etude it has the most Mildy-esque writing, which means what Mildy really likes to do is he likes to kind of circle around the note that he thinks is the important note. So like a really good example of this if you just look at um, measure 17, that's a good example. Um, so, what he really means is, just do an ascending scale. He goes above, he goes below. Another really obvious place that's been bugging me is 14 and 15. So it's just always like a half step off from where you're meaning to go and he likes to jump all around a lot so it's a little noodly. It's going to take some time. I would recommend you start this at a slow tempo. Um, the other thing and the reason I think this is probably etude number three instead of etude number one this year is there are a lot of three octave jumps. Now three octave jumps can be difficult. They can be very difficult depending on how you're working on them. Um, the main thing is that you need to find a way to be more relaxed in the low register than you are in the higher register. Some people do this by changing the vowel they're singing. Some people do it by changing the shape of their jaw or their jaw alignment. Um, I tend to avoid those techniques because I think they all introduce more tension into your playing and tension is bad. And when you, especially when you play bassoon, because if you're tense, you're going to be sharp. Sharp is kind of something we worry about all the time anyway. So there are two things I would recommend you do. First of all, when you've got three octave jumps, like you have in measure five and measure six, don't worry so much about playing the high notes. The high notes will be there, I promise. Your body will find a way to make those high notes sound good. The low notes are the ones that you need to worry about. So first, the first thing I would do in a measure like measure five is I would only play the low notes. So what you have written is like that. I would get rid of the high notes so it sounds like this. And play the low notes as quarter notes and maybe not even in tempo because what you really want is you want those low notes to be in tune every time you play them. If playing the low notes in tune becomes your habit, it will happen when you need it to happen. But if you put off playing them in tune until you're comfortable doing everything else, 
you will have reinforced playing those low notes sharp so many times that it will be really difficult for you to get your pitch down. So start early, start now, get those low notes in tune and make them nice and loud. Um, time with your tuner. You need to spend time with your tuner. Something else you may notice when I'm playing this through, if I'm being a good girl, is you will notice that when I go for the low notes, my stomach actually comes out a little bit. Now, if this isn't something you're used to doing, it can be uncomfortable. It can feel like something you're not supposed to do. And it also can like, if it feels like to, to you, it's gonna make you feel like you look fat, but it doesn't look that way to anybody else in the entire universe. It just looks like that to you because you're staring right down at your gut. So. <laughs> can see it when I'm playing those low notes my lower stomach so around my belly button and below my belly button is actually coming out just a little bit um, other than that one of the things you have to worry about in this etude is high A's and high B flats high A's especially tend to be hard to play in tune it's just hard for us to hear that note and if it's not in tune it won't sound good so I would spend some time with a tuner and a metronome just slowly playing that A, high A, probably at forte, at whatever tempo it is that you need to play it, or tempo, dynamic, whatever dynamic you need to play it in the piece, that's what I would practice. And then once I feel good about that, I will work one note back. So I'm looking at measure 13, measure 13 has a high A in it. Let's say I feel really good about that, about that A. I've worked on it for a day, it's wonderful. Now I'm going to start on the F sharp. And the idea is to play the F sharp with all of the energy that I need for the A. The A is going to not actually be louder than the F sharp. Now I don't have my tuner out. Hopefully I'm kind of in tune, but you should have your tuner out when you're doing this. Have your tuner out, be checking the tuner. Um, that's what I would recommend. Other than that, sometimes we have an articulation marking that we call them carrots. They're like little like carrot shaped things. And when you find that articulation marking in your band music, it means that you play it with a very strong accent. In this piece, don't. In this piece, it's just meaning that you're going to put a tiny little bit of extra weight. It's really easy to over articulate these etudes and make them not sound very musical. So if I was going to play this from a perspective of this is something I'm going to do in band, it would probably sound something like this. <laughs> instead is something that's much lighter. And you might notice that my 16th notes that are staccato are not as short when I play them that way. That is what I think is better in this etude. That's what I want to hear from you. Um, in measure eight, we have a mordant. It's just a little squiggly line. A mordant is essentially a one note trill. You're gonna trill the note exactly one time, and then you're gonna move on with your life. So in the case of measure eight, we have an F with a mordant on it. So you're gonna go F, G, F. There are a few ways to do this. So um, the presenter of the All Region Etudes this year recommended using this key right here. So you play an F and you just hit that key like this. Like that. So in context, because it's only happening once, you could also just do the regular fingering, FGF. It, no matter which way you do it, we have to be able to hear that the first note is an F, not a G. Sometimes it's easy to get overexcited about the mordant. And by the time that the sound comes out of your horn, you're already playing the G. We need to hear the F. Don't worry about doing it too loud. Like that. Um, 
Also, make sure you don't start the Morden early. It should just be exactly on time. Um, beyond that, dynamics. The dynamics are important in this piece because it makes the piece really interesting. I am interpreting, I think it's really important to have a difference between fortes and mezzo fortes. So I'm actually playing the mezzo fortes more like mezzo pianos than like for mezzo fortes. I really want to be able to tell the difference between playing forte and playing mezzo forte. Um, the pianos, um, I'm not as worried about them. All I really care about with the pianos is that they are quieter than the mezzo fortes. Um, there are also some places in this etude where the written dynamics don't give you enough information. So we have a lot of what I call hairpins. That's when you have a crescendo and a decrescendo, but it doesn't tell you how loud the hairpin should start. It doesn't tell you how loud it should get, and it doesn't tell you how loud it should end. So that's when you get to actually make a musical decision on your own. Um, I would recommend whatever decision you make that you write it down, but that is really up to you. So what I would recommend for etude number one is a lot of slow practice. Um, get it very stable at a slow tempo. A lot of focus on playing in tune, especially the low notes, anything at the bottom of the staff or below the staff, and especially the last note before any rest. If you could play the last note in tune, your ear will calibrate to find a way to play the rest of the phrase in tune. Vibrato, I would recommend that on anything that is a quarter note or a longer, especially starting in the middle of this lyrical section, which starts in measure 13. Uh, the trills. So we have a couple of trills uh, starting in measure 32. So here's how you do. First of all, for both of these trills, you start on the written note and then you alternate between the written note and one note higher. So the first trill you're going to do is C to D. So here's how I do that. I just, first let's try it an octave lower. So C in the staff to D in the staff. Okay, all right. Now we're going to do it an octave higher. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to start with your thumb on the C key. That's this one right here. But once you start the trill, you get rid of your thumb. If your thumb is down on any of these keys, the trill will not sound good. So like so. I'm bringing my thumb out pretty far because I want you to see that it's not down. Here's how the trill would sound if I kept my thumb down. So that's not the right notes. It's actually moving the trill so it's like a C to E. So get rid of the thumb. Now E to F trill you can just do with the regular finger. It's just your right hand third finger. Now, as with etude number two, I would recommend that you start playing this piece with no trills because you need to understand how long the notes are. The next thing I would recommend you do is add the Nachschlag at the end so you know exactly when you're going to place it. So start, I'm gonna start measure 31. <laughs> feel good about that. Okay, then you add the trill. Now when we've got a longer trill like this, I like the beginning of the trill to be a little bit slower. I like it to speed up in the middle and then I like it to slow down just a little bit at the end of the trill so you can end it when you want to end it. It kind of is like a musical representation of a figure skater going into a spin. The spin starts slower, it gets faster, and then it slows down as they're coming out of the spin. That's what we want our trills to do. So. Something like that. We also want to make sure people understand which note is the main note. So I like to hold that first note out a little bit more. Um, that's really all I see to this one. 
Start it slow, start it really slow. Do it so slowly that you are absolutely certain you're gonna play all the right notes. And then you have time. As long as you're starting the etude early, hopefully, you know, you're starting the etude before school starts, you're taking some time, even though I know you're in marching schedule, finding a little bit of time here and there to work on it now, find a stable tempo, move it up gradually over time, and you will have enough time to learn this piece and it will be okay. Um, I'm gonna play it through for you. I'm going to do it at 80, which is right in the middle of the tempi that they recommend. They recommend 70 to 92. I'm gonna give it to you at 80. Um, if you're looking for a way to keep working with the metronome that makes you less bored, this is when we start to mess around with metronome settings. So for example, here is 80. This is what I'm going to be doing in a second. Okay, but you can add eighth note subdivision. So it's going to feel different when you do it that way. And that's good because if it feels different, your brain isn't getting as bored when you're playing it. And that's a really good way to throw in some extra repetitions and build your technique. If you get good at that one, here's another one I like. Um, other things you can do, you can practice with the downbeat not being on the downbeat. So like, for example, this is the way it's written. Okay, then you try. And once you get really good at that, you can do something that's varsity level, like... Ah. It's been a while since I've done that one, but do you see what I'm doing? I'm trying to put it on the second one. And so on and so forth. Um, those are the kinds of games we play. Uh, I would recommend with this one because it's a longer one, don't always start at the beginning. Sometimes start at the end, like where the cut is. Um, again, with the cut, sometimes we count measures wrong. So I'm gonna play it with the cut. If my cut does not sound like your cut, please go back to your part and double check your measures. Um, that's really all I have for this one. Um, I feel like it's pretty straightforward as long as you have an idea of how to work on those large intervals. Um, you're always welcome to contact me if you have questions. Uh, you can find me on the Angelo State website. Um, you can also comment on this video and I will try my very best to get back to you as soon as possible. So without further ado, here is etude number three at quarter note equals 80. Ba 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 
Thank you. 